So in the previous demo, we were able to look at weights. Um, let's bring this over. We were able to look at weights and um, get some information about that distribution of weights. Um, And so what we observed is that for all of these um, these 40 weights that we see here down to a weight of 151 pounds, we did the statistics on those weights and what we found is of those 40, n equal to 40, the mean was 172.55, 172 pounds, and the variance um, was what we see here, 693, and the standard deviation was 26.32. Um, the other thing that we were able to do is go into this list of weights and start sampling um, groups of size 10. Right, sample sizes um, of size 10. And what we found when we did those samples of size 10 um, is that even though we know that for if the population is of size 40, um, then we actually have the population mean of 172 and the population standard deviation of 26.32. But what happens if I can't access the entire population, but I can only access, say, 10 at a time. If I can access 10 weights, would that be, um, uh, would that be useful? Would that allow me to infer what the population value is, right? Can I infer? This is inferencing. Can I, from a sample, make a statement, an inference? about the larger population. And if we can, how accurate would that statement be? What guarantees, mathematical or um, probabilistic guarantees might we have regarding how accurate our sample is and what it says about our guess or our inference for the population value? And so what we did is we went ahead and used the tool here in StatCrunch to sample from the 40, 10, and then to do another sample of 10, and then we did another sample of 10 of those weights, and we came up with these values of 166 for the first sample of weights, 172, and then 180 for that third sample. And what we found is that when we take each one of these means, right, each one of these is a mean or s from the sample of size 10, um, that each one differs from the actual population value that we've determined to be 172.55. But if we were to average these out, um, it's not terribly far off. The 172 rounded to 173 is not terribly far off from what we would get if we act, if we um, had the population, um, if we were to guess and look at the population mean. So the mean of the means, right? The mean of the samples is um, is a good approximation and in fact each one of those is an estimate of the population mean. So the mean of the samples is a good estimate um, and it's a point estimate each one of them is a point estimate for the mean of the population. So will this always be true? 
will it always be true that when we sample um, from a population that it will give us an approximate value for the population value um, and that's one thing uh, and, and the central limit theorem makes a statement um, that answers that question and it says that the mean of the samples approximates and tends to the mean um, of the population so the mean of the samples um, if I were to just continue to get and add and calculate more and more of these um, values of size 10, more of these means for samples of size 10, um, we would actually get closer and closer to um, the actual population mean. So we're going to accept that as fact. So that's number one. Number two, what if we were to get the standard deviation on each one of these? Um, what would the standard deviation be on, um, on each one of these samples? And um, what would those and in fact we have those values here the standard deviation for um, let's see if we can put that in here so the standard deviation of the first sample I'll call it x bar sub 1 x bar sub 2 x bar sub 3 um, we have several different means, mean 1, mean 2, and mean 3. What is the standard deviation um, for that sample, right? Because don't forget that for each one of these, they were a sample of size 10. What is the, and then these are the means, and then this would be the standard deviation of the sample. So for this one, um, we had a standard deviation of 29.335 for the next one 25.834664 and then for the third one 25.994068 So each one of these samples has an associated standard deviation with it. Um, and there is an error that's associated with each one of these. Um, but we'll come back to that. What I really want to know is what's the standard deviation, not for each one of these samples. So I'm less concerned about that. What I want to know is, if I were to take these, knowing what the mean is, right? So 166 minus the mean, square it. 172 minus the mean, square it. 180 minus the mean, square it. And divide all of that by n minus 1. I want to know, given that this is the mean of the samples, or so-called sample mean, um, I also want to know what is how much spread there is in these values and so I can determine what the standard deviation is um, amongst the samples so there's and it's 6.86 um, what that says is if you look at that mean of 173, every time you take a sample of 10, you would expect um, to find a mean that's 172, 173, call it plus or minus 6 or 7. So let's say 173 um, plus or minus 7. Um, so anywhere 
from say 167 right 173 minus 7 up to 173 plus 7 call it 180 and that's what we did indeed end up with here so there's not a whole lot of variation um, anytime you take a sample you can expect less variation from the sample means than the amount of variation that you would find um, in the entire um, distribution, the original population distribution. Um, so even though you may see 172 and plus or minus 6 or 7, notice that from the original population, with the mean of 172, the variation is much wider. And the reason why the sample distribution um, has a much smaller standard deviation is because when you take a sample of 10, even though you may have a 135, a 201, a 175, 139, 156, um, you may have some that are really small, you may have some that are really large, and they tend to cancel one another out. And so the um, central limit theorem says that there, even though you may have variation, a standard deviation here, right, some variation in your population, and we found that variation to be plus or minus 26 for, um, for this population. In the, um, the, when we look at the sample means, the variation is going to be uh, much smaller because the extremes tend to cancel one another out. So there's a relationship between the 26.3 and its standard deviation for the population versus the 6.86. Um, and so the central limit theorem tells us, number. this is the second um, important point, it tells us what that relationship is. It says that when we take um, sample, uh, get the sample means, that that standard deviation is going to be um, same as the population. What do we say it was? 26.3, 27, 163. But it's going to be smaller, and it's going to be smaller. So it's going to be divided by the sample size. What was our sample size? Well, we know that our samples were of size 10. So there's going to be less variation. Um, and um, roughly, in this case, what we're getting is 8.3. Um, and it's because we only have these three here that we're working with. But this 8.3 um, is what we would have what we would have guessed, and we would have been off by um, by some, um, right? The actual, but in general, if we were to continue to take repeated samples and get repeated means, there would not be a lot of variation. Um, the standard deviation would be closer to 8.3. So that's the second thing that the central limit theorem gives us. So what the central limit theorem says um, is that as the sample size n increases, the sampling distribution, right, the sampling distribution, the distribution of all these samples, um, they too will have a normal distribution. Um, and they will have a mean equal to the population mean and they will have a standard deviation that as the sample size gets larger it looks like the population um, standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So StatCrunch allows us or helps us simulate um, some of the properties of uh, the central limit theorem. 
So if we go into it, and if we, let's see, choose that one. So under Applets, and we choose Sampling Distributions, um, we can simulate some of the same effects. So whether our initial population is uniform, skewed, or continuous, um, the central limit theorem says that we know something about what the distribution is of the samples. So let's do this. Let's look at the distribution um, of the original data set. So if I go back to the weights and I do a graph, so let's look at the histogram. And let's do a histogram of the weights. And so when you look at this, um, this is maybe the first test for normality. And it looks like um, our weights are normally distributed. Um, so a more formal test that you may see later um, for normality um, is often implemented. So I'm going to go back to the weights and click these here and see if we can get some information from those tests. So what we have here is something called a, a Q to Q plot or plot of um, a quantile plot. And without getting too much into the details, if this plot results in largely primarily a straight line plot, then um, we say that um, that our distribution is normal. So we have a histogram, we have a quantile plot, um, and I'll just use the technology to have that to let that generate uh, the, the data for us. And now we'll focus on the interpretation. And we're looking to see that um, that this is largely on a straight line. And we also have um, an overlaying normal, true normal distribution where the mean is 172 and the standard deviation is 26.327. And then taking a look at one more test, um, we're going to do something called the goodness of fit normality test, um, the Shapiro-Wilk test is one thing that we can use, and what the Shapiro-Wilk test assumes or for the null hypothesis is that the data come from a normally distributed population. So the assumption, the given, the null hypothesis is that this data comes from a normally distributed population. And if in the process, and as a result of doing this test, we come up with um, data that's strong evidence against the hypothesis, the null hypothesis, will say that it's not normal. And strong evidence is a p-value less than 0 0.05, um, meaning that it's improbable that we could get the p-value for that test. So if I do the Shapiro-Wilk test, um, and I do this for the weight, it says that uh, we end up with a p-value of 0.7328, nowhere near the 0 0.05 or 5% um, threshold. So there's not enough evidence to reject um, the null hypothesis. There's not enough evidence to reject that this state is normal. That's one thing. It also gives us the QQ plot, the quantile plot. And it also shows us what um, what the actual curve would be were this perfectly normal. And so that's um, kind of a summary of the weight. Um,
So that's the distribution of the weight. Now, um, what I'd like to do is look at the distribution of samples of the weight. So I'm going to go ahead and use StatCrunch to demonstrate um, the central limit theorem. And what I'm going to do is not have some random distribution of any of these. What I'm actually going to do is use data from the table of weights. So given, um, I went ahead and um, dropped off the standard deviation. So I'm just going to look at means and we're not going to look at standard deviations just yet. I am, this, this histogram tells me that I have maybe a few over here in this range and then on the upper end looks like I have a couple of individuals that are 240 and maybe one or two that are in the 220 and so that's gonna, you'll find that's consistent with the data that's on the chart. So let's go ahead, let's say we were to do something similar to what we just did where we took a sample size of 10. If I do that and I randomly choose 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 individuals get the mean of their weights. You would find that their mean, this 183, is not a bad approximation to the actual population mean. And that's not too dissimilar to what we saw here when we took a sample of size 10. So let's do that again. Let's take 10 individuals, sample them, pull their names out of a hat, and once again we end up with an estimate or, or an, we can get a mean from that sample. And notice that these tend to cluster. Whenever we take 10 different samples and get the mean, they tend to cluster because those on the far left and those on the far right cancel each other out. So I'll do it again. And I end up with another mean, 177. Not, um, not too far from the original 172.55. So 177 versus the 172. This particular sample of size 10 has a mean of 168. That was this one over here. If I do this again, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, we've created this other histogram. Um, this sample has a mean of 179 and a um, for each one of the samples, each one of the sample means that we've seen, the four, they average out to 177. So I could kind of repeat that, get the mean and collect it, do it again, get the mean of those 10, that's the fifth time, sixth time. Um, and notice that 164.9 was the mean of those 10 values, 10 samples. These 10 samples have a mean of 164. And right now we're sitting at 12 samples. Remember, when we did this before, we only looked at three samples and figured out their mean and standard deviation. So at this point, um, our seven samples um, if we were to average them out, they have a mean of 174 and a standard deviation of 7.6672. Um, that's a far cry from the standard deviation of the population. There's a lot, there's a lot more variation in the population. Um, these samples, each time we do one of these samples, even though the population has this variation left to right, um, whenever we take these 10, there's less variation. So I'm going to, now we're looking at eight samples. 
standard deviation 7.559 versus the standard deviation of 25.996. So let me do it five more times. So you should see this 8 go up um, to 13. Okay, so there, 13. Um, and if we were to repeat this, what would this distribution look like? Right? We know that the original population came from a normal distribution. Um, the central limit theorem says that the mean of the means um, is going to come um, incredibly close to the actual population mean. And the central limit theorem also says we know something about the standard deviation, that there's not going to be much spread, that the original population, whatever its spread around the mean is, that these guys are going to sit really close and tight right around this mean of 173.75. So if I do it a thousand times, instead of waiting a thousand more times and a thousand more times, um, at this point we've done it um, 15,000, hit it again. 16,000, hit it again. 17,000. So after, let's say we've done this non-stop months and months, we've gone to 42,000 different samples from that same population of size 40. What the central limit theorem says is that it will always be a normal distribution just like well in this case it happened the, po the population happened to be a normal distribution but these um, the sample distribution will always be a normal distribution under some conditions um, we can we'll qualify that a bit later so that's number one is it'll always be a normal distribution number two and also the central limit theorem also tells us something about the standard deviation that regardless of how much spread there is about the population standard deviation there's a relationship between the 80 the 25.996 and the 8.152 so what does the central limit theorem tell us what's the relationship um, between the histogram generated by the sample values that come out. Well, it tells, and, and then um, what it tells us is that if I take the original standard deviation, 25.996, and if I divide it by the square root of the sample size that I know and can be assured that um, that the spread, the standard deviation, is going to be 8.2. So knowing what the original standard deviation is, the spread of, you know, where 68% um, percent are plus or minus one standard deviation up here, it says that down here um, that the standard deviation of the samples if we were to put them in a histogram, it's going to be the original standard deviation, 25.996, divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 8.2 if we round it to one decimal. Um, and so what we found in our simulation is that it is, in fact, 8.2, rounded off to one decimal. So that's what the central limit theorem gives us. Um, and it does a better job as the sample size increases. What it says is that the sampling distribution approaches a normal distribution, which is what we saw. And it also says that the mean of that distribution is going to approach the mean of the population and that the standard deviation of that sampling distribution is going to be more narrow 
right? It's going to be 8.152 versus 25.996. And in fact, it's even more than that. It tells us that if we just, if we know what the standard deviation is for the population, we can um, make a statement about what standard deviation is for the distribution of the samples, the histogram of the samples. So what can we do with those essentially three facts? Um, that we're going to get a normal distribution, that we know what the mean of that distribution is, and we know what the standard deviation is. Um, those are three really big ideas. And those three assumptions are what we use to do our work. We're going to find that we can use normal CDF in our calculator. Anytime we take a sample, we know that that sample comes from this distribution. And if you know what um, what the distribution is of your sample, then you can do um, probability, you can do certain tests and so forth. Um, so that's a, it, once you know what your distribution is, you can use that information to test ideas to determine probabilities. But you have to know what the distribution is. That's the reason why we use normal CDF because the central limit theorem gives us, mathematically it gives us and through simulation as we've seen, but mathematically um, we're given the, um, the ability and the freedom to take any sample, assuming it's greater than 30 and some other conditions, um, assuming some number of factors, we can, we can take any sample and say, if we're looking for the sample mean, if we, if we want to say something about the sample mean, we know that, um, that, our, that, that we have um, a normal distribution for the sample means. Now, does it matter if our original sample is normal? Does what about if our original sample is flat and um, uniform? Um, how does this distribution affect the shape here? Um, we can do an exercise later that shows it really doesn't matter. Um, there Again, we can qualify all of this, but the broader view is that regardless of the shape, of the original population, um, our sample distribution, um, we're going to take to be normal, um, and we're going to take his mean to be the same as the population mean, we're going to take his standard deviation, standard deviation to be the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So there are two things we want to do after this. We want to see what we can do with it. How do we make how do we do analyses, knowing um, what we know, those three facts? And number two, we need to do a demonstration to show you that regardless of the population distribution, that we can um, make assumptions about this being normal.